Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I am going to talk to Mr. Patrick Gades today. He's the co-founder and CEO of Aperio Group, an investment firm with an astounding $44 billion assets under management by over 10,600 investors. Actually, they were acquired by BlackRock. And who doesn't know BlackRock? The world's largest asset manager for like literally 1.5 trillion in 2020. So uh, Patrick has worked in the financial industry for 40 plus years and he's one of the investing's good guys. And we'll find out if he's the good guy or not. <laughs> but Patrick is also the author of Transparent Investing, a book that combines three themes, how the brain is wired to lead us to make poor investment choices, how the financial industry can prey on our poor judgment and how to decide whether to hire an advisor or try to build a portfolio of yourself. I do like the second part. We know that the Wall Street is always preying on poor judgment or any kind of judgment. So this will be a fun episode. Welcome, Patrick. Well, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Tell us something interesting or funny about yourself. Ah, uh, well, I'll just... By my story, I'll prove that I'm uh, not that interesting. Um, <laughs> one thing that's interesting in the, in the finance world is I was actually a history major in college. And so I couldn't have told you what investing meant even when I was 20. I had no idea of statistics <laughs> or all that quantitative stuff. And I got into it um, in my 20s. I started uh, hanging around some people who were interested in it. And I, my, my family, my parents, I grew up in a very left-wing household. So how do you rebel against that? Wow. You go off to business school. So I landed <laughs> in investing through kind of an odd path and then just found that I I really liked it. And I always liked the history, but I, I was kind of better at the investment. <laughs> side. So that, that's good for all of us. <laughs> what kind of assets do you personally invest in and why? So I recommend everybody think of two very simple kind of buckets for investing. The risky side, which is uh, stocks, real estate, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it can be anything that's high volatility and the safer side, which, okay. uh, I know bonds have <laughs> been badly hammered this year, right now, yes, <laughs> generally bonds and, and, and cash. And so, um, I'm actually all either equity or bonds and I keep my portfolio incredibly simple. There are some complicated offerings out there that are perfectly good. I'm not drawn to them. I like having a really, really basic uh, approach. So for many people, you can own like basically a couple of, uh, you know, like a couple of mutual funds, one index fund and one bond fund. And you're, you're pretty much done. You can mix and match a little. So very, very simple, but getting that balance right between the riskier and the safer, that takes some thinking through around your goals and your sort of emotional Sus, you know your 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 ability to to uh, sustain whipsaws like this year. Like I don't have to speak hypothetically about how bad it is to be in the stock market because we're <laughs> in a you know ugly time. Although it's a lot better than 08, 09 so far. Yeah. No, and it's I think uh, it's still better than two thousand nineteen and twenty. People don't realize it. Just we yep. just got free money. It yep. just kept going up. It, yep. It's about time. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Because you look at things like. I think the market is still up if you measure it over yes, like a two or three. Sure, yeah. so, so it's not it's not great, but hey, you want to go back to 1933? It was yes. like 85% <laughs> down. We are not in that mode. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about uh, investing side and because uh, I was looking at your book, how the yep. investing world actually works. Yeah. And what the investing sharks hope you never figure out. Yeah, so I think the thing they hope you never figure out is how little we actually know about predicting investing. And it, it, dealing with the investment industry is challenging because we have a lot of skills and a lot of services we can offer that are good, but the sort of basic thing of, well, I want to beat the market, 
or I want to time the market. Yes. We're, we're actually very bad at that. So I think the first thing to realize is that um, the investment industry does not know how to predict either which stocks are going to beat the stock market or whether the stock market's going to go up or down. And so my advice is view investing or sorry, view investment advice first as a sales pitch. Don't like, and that's anything stuff you see in in um, you know chat rooms or, or or wherever you know whatever social media wherever you're gathering your 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 insights about investing. There's almost always a motivation. Usually, it's selling you something, and so you want to be a very savvy consumer. The other thing to be very uh, aware of is. Uh, yourself and like how are you susceptible so those are the two kind of tips for how to avoid getting taken by the sharks and and you talk about do it yourself investing so how ca- most of the guys and i i don't invest a lot in stocks uh, by the way you know my podcast is mostly about alternative investing yep so we do focus on real estate a lot yep. more because i believe yep. the tax benefits outweigh all the you know uh, all the other investment types but even even when I'm investing in a stock market right now, I don't personally, but I do have an advisor who does it, right? Because I don't have time. Yep. Then I have friends who invest with me because they don't have time to invest yep. in real estate. They yep. they invest in stocks themselves. Yep. So what are the signs we can use to figure out if I'm qualified for yep. DIY investing? Yep. So the, uh, the first thing is to look at yourself. And there are two pieces you need to bring to the, the party. One is, uh, the most important is what I'll call emotions management. Are you going to be able to ride down a really bad stock market drop, <laughs> like 50%? Most of us can't. <laughs> and most, many of us can't. The uh, thing is, not. advisors aren't any better at predicting, but advisors will tell you, like a wealth advisor will say, look, my clients flip out and sell at, at, during a down market and I'm there to like talk them off the ledge. And that's a really valid service. Right. And it's almost like, you know, you 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 pay a therapist to help you from yes. doing <laughs> hard things that harm yourself. But um, that's one of the big things to look at. Also, do you have the discipline to actually do it? But to your point about time, I think there's an enormous distortion about how much time it takes because people will ask me, um, you know, how much time does it take? Once I've got it set up, how much time does it take to manage a portfolio prudently? And I'd say 90 minutes every three years. No, <laughs> no, no, you're joking. Nice. No. Really, how long does it take? 90 minutes every three years. Because you set your your breakdown between that, that riskier and safer buckets. And you, you may need to do a little rebalancing, but otherwise you just ignore it. You don't need to stay on top of markets. In fact, I'll go further than that and say you shouldn't pay any attention to all the noise going on because it's going to lead you to what uh, behavioral finance or sort of investment psychology calls the illusion of control. So that's how you figure out if you are qualified. The other side to that is what services do you need? Because the investment industry offers very useful services right. and some i call them suspect let's let's call them more <laughs> bogus things yes. like invest with me i'll wisely steer you through choppy water like not nah, bad like and all you have to do is look at the track record the yes. industry's track record is atrocious and and we as individuals our our <clears throat> track record is atrocious um but there are things that are really valuable like financial planning how much do i need to save when should i start mm pulling from retirement um, or an initial asset allocation, like how how much should I have in my riskier and my safer, or maybe some tax tips. But those aren't the things investors usually want, which is, are you going to beat the stock market? Or are you going to keep me from right. losing money? And the, the honest answer is you, you know, Ms. Consumer, Mr. Consumer, you have no idea what's going to happen. But my line on that is, why do you want to pay me a lot of money since I have no idea either what's going to happen? Right. No so one has it, a crystal ball. <laughs> it, and so it's all about set your asset allocation and then don't tweak it, don't fiddle with it for, especially for the long term, like 20, 30 years. That's how people get really wealthy. But that is 
extremely hard to make appealing because it's so boring and it's so passive, like passive index, passive investing is the same as indexing. That's the problem with passive is it feels so passive. And that's why we get ourselves in trouble is we think we have control over something that's actually random. And for millennia, certainly since recorded history, humans, we freak out when we're presented with evidence that we don't actually control things and we make up narratives and stories to imply we do control things we don't. And that's a good chunk of the investment industry. But I'm not a total cynic. You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. The investment advice can be really useful as long as you're not expecting you're going to get someone to uh, predict the future, like when the market's going to be up or down. No, that's pretty interesting. And and when I started investing in stock market, I got steered towards option and futures in back Ooh. in 2015. And I got my <laughs> back handed out to me in 2016. And I realized this is not for me. And then of course the time I started looking at ROT return on my time where yep. I was watching the market like every hour and futures, Forex, they are open 24 hours by yep, the way, yep. right? Yeah. So I was always emotional. I was always, you know, I would say stressed out, right? Interesting. If, so I'm like, okay, this is not for me. I, yep. I, I like passive. I like boring. That's why I went yep. to the real estate side where yep. I can just buy, rent out the property and exactly. you know, let the property manager handle everything. Uh, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and real estate is interesting because I don't own any, but it's a perfectly valid asset class. It's, it's, it's riskier than bonds, but it's got a higher return, but it's not as doesn't get as high a return as the stock market over time, but it tends to be lower volatility. So it's, uh, and it's got some great tax advantages, but you may need to know something about it if you're going to do it directly, as opposed to just buying a bunch of REITs. Right. Um, so unlike um, stock investing, where you just can buy a single index fund and you're done, you don't have to research anything. As long, right. but you're basically, you're buying world capitalism. Right. And so, that's one difference, but I, I have a lot of respect for good real estate investment. I mean, there's also a lot of, uh, like like any investment industry, you got to watch out for people trying to sell oh, yes. stuff. Of course, but it's a <laughs> it's a very solid asset class. Um, it's just it's not as easy to come up with a super simple portfolio. Yeah, yeah, stocks anyone can do it, and that's why you know anyone can get started. But right now, most of the people, right, they all, they don't like the index. As you said, it's boring. Everyone wants to pick the next next Tesla, next and, Apple, and, and brag. The 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 <laughs> uh, my my viewpoint is, it's not just a financial consumption that it's actually a kind of bragging rights. In fact, um, there's some fascinating research on how. Uh, as a, in general, on average, men and women approach investing differently. Women are slightly better. The oh, reason the okay. reason is how oh, why <laughs> they're not smarter. They don't do as much, uh... and men try and trade. Too much. <laughs> so think of the the goal. Let's say you're in a room full of a hundred people, and this could apply to men or women. But you'll see which the sort of um, av where it tends to segregate out. So if your goal is to look around the room and see those ninety nine other people, and your goal is, I want to be number one. I want to be the best investor in this room, the highest return, which is a perfectly normal sounding goal. The problem is indexing will never get you to be number one. You'll end up coming in around the top. Well, uh, like if everyone else is active, uh, you'll come out around the like 85th percentile. If you're taxable, oh, wow. maybe okay. even 95th percentile. So you're going to be doing really, really well but you'll never be number one. So if your goal is, I want to maximize my ending wealth, given the amount of risk I'm willing to take, then this really boring indexing is a terrific approach. And so if you're super competitive and you want both the money and the bragging rights, right. now you're in trouble because the bragging rights go with, you know, hitting home runs, use a sports metaphor and, um, the having the most money mathematical probability wise is this incredibly boring solution. So it's, it's what I like to say about investing is 
it's very simple, but it's not easy because we're wired, especially males, to be after uh, you know the next shiny thing and the bragging rights of you know I bought company X when you hadn't even heard of it is so gratifying, but that's not actually the best way to get wealthy. It is the best way if your goal is like, let's say your net worth is half a million and you want to have it go up a hundred times to 50 million in 10 years. Yeah. Indexing is not going to get you there, but the odds are heavily, heavily stacked against you. If you want to try that for maximizing your 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 ending value so if you want to win you need to go active if you want the most money in terms of probability you go indexing passive oh that's pretty interesting so uh this was very interesting when you mentioned women are better investors than men and then now i started comparing to myself and my wife just and i yes i try to do everything I try to look at every asset type, every investment vehicle possible. Because it's fun. It's, yeah, it's it's interesting, and you're yeah, constantly now, learning. And yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I of course have been doing cryptos for a while. So yep. crypt, for some people it's new, but for yep. me it's like five years. Yep. No, 2015 yep. is when I started. So, so you're it's an old hand. Old. Yep. But now I'm looking at you know collectibles, wines and whiskeys, yep. and a lot of yep. other <laughs> asset class just to understand what else is out there yep. and investing in farm, agriculture, all. Wow. And, wow. and my wife is like, oh, yeah, just buy this one piece of property and don't yep. worry about and it. Don't that, worry about that's it. That's yep. good enough. <laughs> yep, exactly. In fact, what's interesting is, you know what group of people does even better than women? Who? Which group? <laughs> Dead people. <laughs> Fidelity re, uh, released some data that uh, um, oh yeah uh, that that uh, accounts that had been closed because someone had died and I think it was I'm not sure um, situations where there was no one monitoring the account those right. had the highest returns why because they were doing absolutely nothing they don't have any emotions <laughs> and, exactly exactly and and very well put so in fact the uh, where I got that story was from a uh, uh, I, uh, someone I know um, has written a book and he told that story and he said his advice is if you're a man, invest like a woman. If you're a woman, invest like a dead person. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is very interesting. So let's talk about using your brain or heart, right? So when you're yes. investing, should we invest using our brain or heart or using heart? Or, or wow. what uh, is you know, has a, more uh, hazardous? <laughs> um. I, you know, I've never been asked it that way. I, um, I'm not sure either is the right answer. Ba basically, um, the smartest way to, the most effective way to invest is like a Zen master where <laughs> you, uh, what, what's the, it's the play on the traditional line, you know, don't just do something, sit there. And that's, what's great. So, it, I, I love it that you framed it as, should I use my heart or my brain? My answer would be neither, because if you use your heart, as you described for yourself, you'll be on the the roller coaster, right, riding emotional. around, and you know that's that's for other parts of life. That's for right. for you know your love life or or whatever moves you, you know, or arts or whatever. But not for investing. You don't want those emotions driving because they lead you to make bad decisions. But right. then back to the brain piece, and I love that juxtaposition. That implies that you need to spend a lot of a time, a lot of time analyzing and and quantitatively crunching them. Like yes, no, neither. Just buy and and uh, basically the stock market will pay you for the strength of your stomach lining, and if you can ride <laughs> through a lot of ups and downs, um, that's the way to get really wealthy. I I, uh, I uh, tell a story in the uh, uh, online. Uh, interactive version, a course version of the book, Transparent Investing, um, about one of the great, my great heroes of investing, someone you've probably never heard of, a woman named Grace Groner. Hmm. You might well ask, who's that? No, I've heard and of I, Jesse Livermore and right. others. So but not, Grace no, Groner lived for uh, just over 100 years. She was born in 1909 wow. and died in 2010. At the age of 25, she bought $180 worth of stock at the company where she worked. And this mm. story would work just as well if she just bought you know, a stock market index. She got a slightly higher return, I think. She never, 
ever sold that. She reinvested all the dividends. Every uh, When she was late in life, people thought she was impoverished and they would like bring her food. She died 75 years after buying that stock that she'd never sold. It was worth 7.2 million. Whoa. Now, why was she brilliant? Because she picked the right stock. No, that's not the point yeah. of the story. It's what she didn't do. She re made it through the Great Depression, the Second yeah. World War, <laughs> uh, Vietnam, the collapse in the yes. 73, 74. She didn't sell during the uh, 2000 dot com meltdown. She didn't sell yeah, in not the 08 Gulf War, Gulf War, she, everything. <laughs> yep. She just stayed very calm and never, ever sold until she needed it, which she, she ended up giving the money to a. Uh, uh, the college okay. where she'd gone. Wow. So she's my hero for what she didn't do. Not, not, but she was disciplined and no, she had a great track record, but it's not a very sexy story, is it? It's just, nope. she was grounded. Yeah. Nope. And then she gave pretty much all of it away. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I forgot to mention brain, heart or ear. Like when someone tells me, you oh, buy this stock. <laughs> ah, ah, yeah. I like that one. That's, that's almost right? like the, the social the social yeah. value of yeah. Uh, yeah yeah it's all the game gamestop uh ready to all yep, that yep, stuff. Yep, yep. <laughs> so are we uh let's talk about the economy right now sure. are we headed to or are already in a recession well i'm going to be one of your more boring guests i have <laughs> no idea i don't pay attention to that stuff i i mean i think it's very interesting i'm not a macro economist I mean, basically, I look at economic models and right now it is a fascinating time because what we're seeing is that our traditional understanding of economics and the models we use isn't quite working because you ask most Americans, how is the economy? You'll get pretty universal. Like, it's awful. It's terrible. Yeah. Okay, so why is unemployment the lowest it's been? Exactly. In, it's why either 40 or 50 years. It's so strong. It's so weird. we got this weird, like, inflation, a lot of pessimism, stock market collapsing. And did you say unemployment 3.5%? How, how can that yeah. be right? It's a great example of, huh, stuff doesn't always work the same right. way. So are we in a recession? I mean, I, you know, I, I only know the sort of technical definition of what is it? Two quarters of consecutive yeah, technically, yes. decline, but, but, <laughs> but, but it, I mean, my wife was asking me this recently. She said, I don't quite get how we can have a recession with record low unemployment. I was like, me neither. I, I just, I don't know. So I think the lesson is you know, consistently throughout everything I'm preaching is um, don't try and make decisions based on areas where we may not know what's going on. I, humility is usually associated in monetary terms with poverty, right? Like, you know, yeah. the, the uh, Buddhist monks or the little sisters of mercy in the Catholic church or something. But actually, humility can make you much, much wealthier because when you don't trade and you don't pay a, a wealth advisor if you don't need one and you just index. Most of the research would show like over a 30 year period, you're going to have around double the assets you would if you went the normal path. But it's it's it's. It's hard to do that because it just doesn't sound right. It sounds so like it sounds like you're surrendering. And that's back sort of the 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 Buddhist side. I just wrote an article called uh, Zen in the Art of Portfolio Maintenance that it's ironic that doing nothing is so sound an approach in investing. And it's it's why you then end up realizing your your two um, hurdles you need to overcome or an industry that wants to sell you stuff, some of which can be useful, some of which is garbage. And the other hurdle is your own brain. It's like your, your brain is hazardous to your wealth. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. This is great. Are you ready for fire round? Sure. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy because of inflation or recession and i think one of it is going to stay for some time yeah <laughs> so i would say for investing no i mean you everyone should have been paying attention to inflation even two years ago obviously i was surprised when it popped up this strongly um you do need to remember that it's the high risk assets that allow you to endure inflation I mean, bonds and cash are terrible right. from an inflation perspective but that doesn't mean 
don't own any bonds or cash, you still got to balance out your 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 uh, risk tolerance. And by that, I mean, like, don't go so aggressively that you then bail out when everything blows up. That's a bad call. Be realistic about what you can tolerate. But which businesses, that's sort of more nuanced. Like, I'm sure there are certain businesses that will do better or worse in, a, in an inflationary or, or recession environment. But that's kind of, you know, business specific. That's awesome. Favorite real estate or finance or maybe business book? You mean besides mine? <laughs> yes, exactly. I was going to say that. <laughs> so um, on the investment side, just because of who he is, um, I'm a big fan of Jack Bogle's uh, little book of common sense investing. Not that it's got great breakthroughs, but he's so, um, you know, obviously you could gather he's someone I admire greatly. Um on the psychology side, there are a couple really fun books. Um, one's called Super Forecasting by uh, Tetlock and uh, Gardner. And that's a book about how hard it is to predict. And the people who are the best at it are, they're not like super geniuses in terms of intelligence. They are relatively smart. What makes them extraordinary is even when they make a good decision, they go back and they're ruthlessly scrutinizing their own decision-making process, looking for where they slipped up, where they had biases. There's, I was reading it, hoping he'd talk about humility. And he went even further. He says, no, what makes you really good is when you're like unsparingly judgmental and harsh about your own decisions, even when you were right, which is a theme uh, that shows up in another book called Thinking in Bets by a gambler named Annie Duke. And her oh, book I is- I love that book. Oh yeah, it's great because she talks mm. about this thing called resulting, which is a term I'd never heard of before reading that book, which means you measure the success of decisions on their outcome rather than whether they were good decisions at the time. Mm. And she cites this great example from a, a US football, a, a Super Bowl game, I think it's about 15 years <laughs> ago, maybe more, where- uh, very near the end of the game, it was the uh, Seattle was playing New England, and Seattle had the ball, and they were is it very get? yeah yeah they're about to <laughs> score, and, and they threw the interception, and everybody said Pete Carroll made the dumbest decision in football history, and he said it wasn't a stupid decision, it, it wasn't a terrible decision, it was a terrible outcome, and then he showed the stats. What, what's the probability of uh, losing a fumble on a run versus an interception? Fairly close. Put in the time part. And of course, everyone was projecting you made the wrong call. He didn't make the wrong call. He just had a really bad outcome happen. And what if their star back had fumbled the ball? Would they have said, oh, he made the wrong call. He should have passed. So there's right. this hindsight bias of, Oh, you should have known. And that's back to the humility side. No, he didn't make a bad call. And that's where Annie Duke is great on um, kind of uh, how the brain works, which is very helpful for uh, for the self-awareness. And of course, self-awareness is not always a great thing. In my case, I'm sure others are like this. Self-awareness means you see a lot of really unpleasant behavior, egotistical things, things times where you argue something, you don't really have any good uh, justification. Maybe your man's playing and it's uh, self-awareness is very hard emotionally. Yeah. Any tool or website you recommend or you cannot live without? Um, the, the uh, What I like are some of the uh, financial planning tools. Um, Vanguard has a good one. Fidelity, Schwab. I, I'm not saying take the advice on all those sites, <laughs> but they have some really good tools for how much do I need to save in terms of retirement just to, to help quantify things. Cause unless you're a spreadsheet geek, that's not always intuitive to be able to calculate how much you need to save your, your sort of retirement needs. I don't tend to like most, as you can guess, sort of stock tip yes. um, uh, sites though. Any advice for beginner investors? Uh, it's, it's a lot of what I've been saying. Um, just because you don't know what's going to happen, don't presume you can't do it yourself and please be wary of how the industry sells you things. And it's not that you should be confident. 
it's that you should be clear that um, the the widely accepted um, sort of conventional wisdom that you need to be very smart and spend a lot of time that is bogus <laughs> but unfortunately that leaves people with okay fine so what do i do and i've i mean i i, I was counseling a friend recently um and i went through that whole list of the do-it-yourself the question you asked me earlier and this is a very smart person she's a, a technical writer in, in science so she's understands statistics the way she talks about the pandemic is like boy you really get stats and probability and I walked her through this whole thing and she just said, you know, I think I need to hire someone at low cost for maybe a couple of years and then I'll take it over. Because I just, the whole thing just freaks me out. And I thought, you know what? You're self-aware. You're making the decision with your eyes open. So that's what I'd ask uh, or suggest to any new investor is try and be wary of how much you're being sold stuff. And there is no brilliant uh you know wizard behind the curtain like that great scene in the wizard of oz like you pull back the curtain and it's just some guy blabbering into a microphone there is no great wizard you can go and hire and stop thinking that but that's kind of a disappointment but it, if you want to keep your money uh it's a great way to approach it how do you give back uh, so but sort of normal means the, uh, the you know, the financial side uh, gave away a great deal of the proceeds when when we sold our company um, and then uh, do some volunteer stuff, some on the more kind of financial side, because that's my background. And uh, with some nonprofits, I even do some free consulting on uh, on kind of branding and differentiation, which is a little weird because I'm not what you would call an expert in that, but it's. It's so gratifying. And these, this one organization I work with, um, the, the people who lead it keep saying, oh, it's so insightful the way you describe how we need to differentiate. And I keep telling them, I'm just repeating your words back to you kind of in business speak. Like, I didn't figure any of this out. You told it to me. I'm just returning, which, you know, what's the joke about a consultant is somebody who looks at your watch and tells you what time it is. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, how my pleasure. My, how can my listeners reach out to you? Uh, so my website, um, patrickgettis.co, um, has all the uh, all they need in terms of the book. And as I mentioned, there's this uh, online course. Um, and so that's uh, uh, that's the best way to, to get that material. And the book's available uh, at uh, bookstores, Amazon, wherever you go. Well, this was great. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I enjoyed it. Uh, nice, nice, lively conversation. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing.